All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to be tackling what I think is probably one of the most underappreciated styles of Belgian beer out there, a Belgian double. Here on this channel, I will typically do either a grain to glass video like I'm doing right now, where I show you every aspect of the brewing process from the recipe all the way through the final tasting of the beer in a single video so you don't have to look around for other stuff. I also do a lot of other shorter, more informative content like equipment reviews and techniques and teaching videos. So if you like that sort of thing, please stick around and hit that like button. Also hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content like that. Anyway, today we're making a Belgian double, or I think it might also be pronounced Belgian double. Uh, it depends on who you ask, because I have had pros tell me either one. For the purposes of this video, though, we will be saying double. Um, of the four Trappist styles of beer out there, uh, single, double, triple, and quad, or dark strong ale, um, I have actually only made three of them on this channel, so that would be the single, the triple, and the quad. Um, I have full intention of making these styles multiple times on the channel because they're some of my favorite kinds of beer, uh, but it's about time we actually check double off of that list. The reason why I say double is kind of like a, a very underrated or underappreciated style of beer is simply because it just sits in the shadow of its cousin, the Dark Strong Ale or the quad. The double and the Dark Strong Ale have very similar flavor profiles, However, the difference between the two of them really comes down to alcohol percentage and also just the intensity of those flavors. They're going to have very rich multi flavors with lots of dark fruit notes and raisins, plums. They're also going to have a ton of aromatics from the Belgian Trappist style yeast. Uh, it's going to kick out a lot of clove, banana, and pear kind of esters along with some spices and stuff like that. For the most part, the Belgian quads are very strong in alcohol, though they're like 9 to 14% ABV. They're very easy to drink, they're very dangerous beers, and if you're not careful, you'll drink a couple of them, and uh, you'll probably, they'll catch up to you a little bit faster than you anticipated. With a double, on the other hand, you are looking at more of like a 6 to 8% beer, which is a lot more manageable when the beer is dangerous. So you have this wonderful combination of highly complex malt flavors, uh, as well as a wonderfully dry finish and easy drinkability uh, in this beer in combination with um, a not so high ABV package as, as a quad, but still a lot of the same flavors and enough kick in there to keep things interesting. One of these things that makes these beers so unique is the fact that it always seems like they have extremely complicated recipes, when in fact they don't. A lot of their complexity is really coming from a very special secret ingredient called candy syrup, and uh, or candy sugar, and in this case specifically dark candy sugar. Candy sugar essentially is an invert sugar, but that means in its simplest form is that it's a very easy sugar for yeast to break down and ferment. However, it's a traditional ingredient in Trappist style beers. That's one of the reasons why quads, triples, and, and doubles are so high in alcohol, uh, but don't really feel it. The uh, dark candy syrup in particular undergoes a tremendous amount of caramelization and uh, Maillard reactions when it's actually being condensed and formed into this super sweet, super delicious substance that's actually responsible for a tremendous amount of the flavor in an entire beer like this. Traditionally, you could make a Belgian quad or a Belgian double using only two fermentables, just a bunch of Belgian Pilsner malt and then a bunch of dark candy syrup. But I've seen a lot of recipes out there for the same beers that have you know eight to 10 different malts on that list to try and replicate the flavors that you get from a high quality candy syrup, uh, which by the way, not all of them are created equal. We are lucky nowadays to actually have very high quality candy syrups available out there and I do recommend using them over creating a highly complicated malt bill because you will end up with a high finishing gravity and it's just going to turn into a completely different beer than what we want. In some cases with the pale uh, versions of the candy syrup, especially the lightest colored ones, you can substitute other sugars in to get the same effects. However, with the dark stuff, it's not really as easy to do that. The closest substitutes would be something like molasses or turbinado sugar or perhaps some treacle. Um, but for the most part, you're really not going to get anything like what you're going to get out of a high quality dark candy syrup. So what I'm going with today is this stuff. This is, uh, it's called, it's just called D180, uh, 180 being the color in SRM. And it's made just simply by Candy Syrup Incorporated. However, I've used this stuff before and uh, I can 
vouch for its effectiveness, I can vouch for its complexity. Um, and the darker you go in these sugars, they actually have a 240 version, by the way, which is even darker, um, the more flavor you will get, uh, and the more of those uniquely Belgian quad-like flavors you'll get. Um, now, keeping in mind, of course, that the intensity of this beer is not to be matched with a quad, we're not going to use this entire package. We're going to use about three quarters of it, and that should get us around the right uh, percent ABV, as well as around the right uh, level of intensity of these flavors. If we use too much of this, this will turn into a quad. We don't want a quad. Not yet, at least. All in all, I've been looking forward to this brew for a very long time, actually. I've spent a while developing this recipe and coming up with uh, every little piece of it that I think is gonna make a difference in this beer. So let's go ahead and jump into that recipe now. So first of all, this is our grist here. We're looking at 11 and a half pounds of Belgian Pilsner malt. If you're making a Belgian beer, it's always good to pick the Belgian Pilsner malt if you can find it. Um, in my case, I am using Dingemann's. On top of that, we're gonna add one pound of wheat malt. Wheat malt is going to contribute a significant amount of protein into the overall beer. Uh, this protein is gonna help increase the head retention uh, that we should get that is characteristic of a Belgian beer. If you ever pour a Belgian beer, you'll see that it has a tremendous, rocky, strong, well-structured head, and that stays around for a long time. The wheat malt, I think, is gonna help quite a bit in terms of making that happen. To that, I am adding only two specialty malts and a very small amount of them at that. We're gonna do half a pound of Special B. Special B is a darker Belgian crystal malt that has the effect of adding a lot of those raisin and plum kind of date flavors, uh, but only half a pound of it uh, should kind of put that as a sort of a background note. And then on top of that, we're adding half a pound of aromatic malt. All the aromatic malt is going to do is increase the richness um, of the malt flavor overall. And that is uh, just a half a pound of that is all you need um, and you should be good to go. And lastly, we're gonna be adding three quarters of a pound of this D180 candy syrup. Uh, and that is not going to happen during the mash. That is going to happen as we are heating up to the boil. Normally people add sugars at the very end of the boil and that just allows you to kind of incorporate them into the wort and bump up your original gravity without incorporating any sort of uh, caramelization. Well, we're gonna turn that concept around. We're gonna actually add the candy syrup at the very beginning of the boil. Not even when it gets to a boil. I'm adding it pretty much right as soon as I'm able to mash out and start watering. Uh, this way, that sugar gets incorporated early on. It won't scorch because it's gonna be fully dissolved but it is going to aid in a little bit of extra caramelization, and that caramelization is an important part of the overall flavor of this beer. So we'll see how that works. If I end up scorching this beer, I'll let you guys know, and you'll know not to do what I'm doing right now. For hops, it's a decidedly not hop forward beer. Um, I'm adding just enough hops to keep the balance where it should be. We're using traditional hops for a Belgian Trappist style ale. Those are Styrian Goldings. All of my Styrian Goldings is three and a half percent alpha acid. So we're adding two ounces of Styrian Goldings at 60 minutes and half an ounce of Styrian Goldings at 15 minutes. Um, and all that's gonna do is bring us up to about 20-ish, 22 IBUs. Um, and that should be all we need to do to keep it in balance. For yeast, and this is a critical ingredient in a Belgian beer, uh, we're using a big starter of Y Yeast 1214 Abbey Ale. Sometimes I'll use 3787, the Trappist uh, high gravity strain from Y Yeast, and that's been fine before, but I like to kind of switch my yeast around and see what happens. And I think uh, the 1214, I think is the Chimay strain, but I might be wrong. Um, Either way, I want to try it out. I want to see how that compares to the other Belgian yeasts that I've used, like uh, the 3787. And uh, I've also used T58, which is also supposedly the Chimay strain, but that made a fantastic quad. So if that's the same yeast, I will be very happy to use it here. Um, once again, a big starter is pretty much necessary because the gravity of this beer is going to be pretty significant, probably hopefully 1060 to 1070. For our water profile, it's gonna be a relatively balanced profile, um, trying to keep the minerals a little bit lower than most other beers um, from Europe. Uh, so we're gonna go with 68 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, nine parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 81 parts per million of sulfate, and 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that profile, I'm adding three grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, five grams of calcium chloride, and one gram of sodium bicarbonate. 
Now, when I plugged this into Brewer's Friend, uh, the water calculator, it anticipated that I would actually have a pH of about 5.7 in the mash, which is a no-go. Uh, so we are probably going to need to acidify the wort and make some adjustments with lactic acid as soon as I mash in. So I'm gonna be very careful to check that and keep an eye on the pH um, as this is moving around. I wanna probably bring that down to about 5.4 or 5.5 uh, range for the pH. Just keep this in mind if you want to use that same water profile and you have a similar grist that's all very pale, um, you might need to acidify your mash later on. Now, speaking of the mash, this is the last part here. This is going to be a step mash. I'm going to try and take advantage of the step mashing technique to allow for a dry finishing beer that still has enough body to be interesting. And we're also going to be doing a very short protein rest on this one. The protein rest is not really necessary when you're using today's highly modified malts. It's really more meant for a high protein grist or if you have uh, traditional heritage malts or floor malted malts um, that have different enzymatic content. We're doing it to kind of take advantage of its ability to kind of create medium chain proteins, which essentially just boost the amount of head retention you're going to get. Um, however, this can be very detrimental if you hold the temperature for longer than about 15 minutes. So I'm not even going to try and mess with that. I'm going to leave it at about 10 minutes. Now this particular step mashing technique for a Belgian beer, I got from none other than Gordon Strong. So I do kind of trust that it's going to be pretty good. Uh, but this is what it is. We're going to do a short 10 minute protein rest at 131 degrees. Then we will ramp up to our beta sac rest, which is going to be 145 degrees for 30 minutes. We're going to get a lot of conversion during this time. However, because that temperature is pretty low, the conversion activity is not going to be super fast. Uh, so we're actually not going to probably hit full conversion even in 30 minutes. So after 30 minutes have elapsed on our, our beta rest, we're going to ramp up to our alpha rest at 158 degrees. That's going to be held for 45 minutes and that allows us to denature most of the beta enzyme and allow the alpha to take over. The alpha amylase enzyme basically creates slightly longer chains of sugars which increase the perception of body and sweetness in the final beer. Uh, but when held in combination with a shorter beta rest at the lower temperature, we should actually end up getting a beer that is both dry finishing and fermentable, but also has enough body in it to uh, remain interesting. Last but certainly not least, we'll also do a mash out as we usually do at about 170 degrees just to ensure that we have good water. All right, so our water is heated up to the protein rest temperature. So thank you for coming to my TED talk. Let's go make some beer. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached the required temperature, I mashed in with my grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit at the protein rest temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes and then I raised it to the next temperature which was 145 degrees Fahrenheit for the beta amylase rest. At this time I also took a pH measurement and I saw a measurement of 5.6 uh, which is a bit high uh, but around what was predicted by a brewer's friend so I added about 4 grams of lactic acid to the mash and that brought the pH down to about 5.4. I let the mash sit at the beta amylase rest temperature for 30 minutes and then I raised to the alpha rest temperature of 158 degrees Fahrenheit and let that sit for 45 minutes. Once the step was finally complete, I raised to 170 degrees Fahrenheit for the mash out step. After reaching that temperature, I let it sit for 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading and recorded a measurement of 14.4 bricks or 1057. This was actually about two points higher than my target pre-boil gravity. Soon after, I added my three quarters of a pound of dark candy syrup and mixed thoroughly. Once I reached the boil, I actually did nothing, waiting for 30 minutes before I added my first top addition which was two ounces of Styrian Goldings. Then I let the boil continue for another 45 minutes. Then I added my 15 minute hop addition, half an ounce of Styrian Goldings. I also added a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient at this time. Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. Uh, this is definitely the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. Once the boil was done, I took everything inside where I could hook my chiller up to the sink and begin chilling. I let the wort chill to about 65 Fahrenheit and then I pitched my yeast starter. I aerated the entire thing with Pure O2, 
uh, with a dose of about one minute at full blast. And then I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 17.7 bricks, which is uh, about 1071. So the fermentation of a Belgian style Trappist style ale is almost always going to be geared towards attenuation. So what you want here is for the beer to get basically as dry as you can get it. Um, and that means simply said, ramping the temperature up from a lower value at the very beginning of fermentation to a higher value at the end of fermentation and then letting it rest there for a bit. And with a beer like this that is rather high in alcohol, uh, we're going to want to make sure that that fermentation is healthy. So number one, pitch a big yeast starter. And I'm pitching about a one liter starter. You can alternatively pitch maybe like two liquid yeast packets for a beer like this. Or if you go up into the 1080, 1090 range, you probably want to pitch more than two. Uh, at that point though, you really just, just make a starter. The other thing too is that there's a lot of sugar, like simple sugars in this beer. And as a result, the yeast can tend to kind of go overboard on that stuff at first. And it can create some rather harsh flavors. Um, and it needs a little time for that, and you, you might end up getting sort of like a hot alcohol note out of it if you drink it too young. So, because of that, you kind of need a little bit of a conditioning period. Now, traditionally, these beers are bottle conditioned. You're bottling these beers, you have a second fermentation in the bottle, they condition, they develop additional flavors, and then you crack them open later and they taste amazing. Uh, now, you can sort of do the same thing in a keg, and that's what I'm going to do here. This is by no means a beer that I'm trying to turn around in like a week or two. Uh, it's just not possible with a Belgian beer like this. They are going to be at their best when they're given the time to mature and condition out. That is generally done best in a bottle. However, you can do something very similar in a keg. So all we're going to do is, once fermentation is actually done, we'll just transfer into a keg, and then we'll prime that keg with priming sugar just as if it was a bottle. And then we'll let it age for about two or three weeks, see where we're at, and then we'll just continue to taste the beer and see how it ages over time until we get to a point where it's really good. And then we'll just take that keg, we'll drop it into the kegerator, and and uh, everything should be good to go. And that should give us about the same result as if we had bottle conditioned. It this method requires a bit more patience, obviously, but this is, once again, not a beer we are trying to turn around in a week or two. So in a nutshell, for fermentation, pitch a large starter of healthy yeast and ferment at about, I would say, 65 degrees for the first couple days. Once that primary fermentation starts to kind of drop back down a little bit, start ramping up the temperature by one degree Fahrenheit per day. And then you're gonna continue that all the way up until about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So your total fermentation time is gonna be somewhere around two weeks, plus or minus a few days. Uh, at that point then, transfer over into your keg or bottle at that point, and then let it condition and carbonate for another couple weeks, and then let it age until it starts to taste really nice, fine, and matured. And at that point, you should be good to enjoy. All right, so our final gravity is here, and it's actually about 10.08. Um, got kind of dry. <laughs> uh, but that puts this somewhere north of 8%, uh, so that's pretty crazy. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and package this at some point this week. And i um, not really going to rush it at all because it's a high-alcohol beer and needs some time to kind of mellow out. But um, we're going to go ahead and package it and then start the conditioning process. So I think the evolution of this beer is pretty much complete. It's been about a month since we actually uh, were able to package the beer. So what I did when I packaged it was I actually bottled off about 10 or 12 uh, 12 ounce bottles and primed those in the bottles and then the rest of the beer I just put it in the keg. Now I primed the keg as well. So basically I made up a priming sugar solution, added six ounces of that to the keg, then I transferred the beer into the keg on top of the priming sugar and it naturally carbonated the keg over about two weeks. And I basically treated the bottle and the kegs the same, letting them naturally carbonate over the course of about two weeks to about three volumes of CO2. And the only way you can get that to work with a bottle is by using the appropriate type of bottle. This is a thick-walled Belgian-style bottle that can handle higher volumes of CO2. I would definitely not advise carbonating over three volumes of CO2 in a standard 12-ounce uh, brown bottle. Once both beers had carbonated up, I let them sit in cold storage for about another two weeks. So all in all, about four weeks from the uh, packaging to the actual tasting now. This additional cold storage step kind of helps round out some of the flavors. The beer did turn out to be rather high alcohol uh, and needed a little more time to kind of mellow out. Now normally I would pour from the tap, but today since I have those bottles, I figured why not actually just crack open a bottle instead. Okay, so the beer is called Ne Perle Pas La Tête, which means don't lose your head. 
in French. It comes in at a pretty solid 8.4% ABV and 22 IBUs. So for appearance of the beer, it's a deep brownish red color. It's unfortunately not as clear as I wanted it to be. But far and away the most disappointing thing about this beer is that the head goes away pretty much as soon as you pour the beer, leaving a small layer on the surface, but none of that classic Belgian uh, fluffy, rocky, well-structured head that stays around for a long time. And that means that I held my protein rest temperature too long and basically destroyed the protein network that would have been needed to, uh, to create such a head. Uh, so unfortunately adding that protein rest step in there completely backfired on me and it was totally unnecessary to make this beer. I just thought it would be an added thing, but uh, that is that. Unfortunately, um, we are left with a less interesting looking Belgian beer than otherwise I could have gotten. All right, so now we're gonna go in for aroma. So the aroma on this one is, uh, is actually really, uh, really complex and really nice. It's not as deep, it's definitely not as deep as a Belgian quad is, but it's got a lot of complexity to it for sure. So it's mostly got just kind of like a, a dark fruit sweet kind of note, like a figgy raisiny thing. Don't really get any breadiness. I don't really get any malt per se coming out of it. We get a lot of also like higher alcohols um, that are coming out of this, like a like a rose kind of florally kind of um, character. It's actually really interesting because uh, that means that the high temperatures involved in this fermentation created some of those higher alcohols, but they also were correct. They also were fully converted into these really pleasant esters um, instead of remaining as fusel alcohols. There's a lot of complexity to this. It's like a dark sugar kind of thing going on, like a perhaps a um, a molasses. Now, go for mouthfeel. Wow. <laughs> So unfortunately it doesn't have the head retention I wanted, but it is still very highly carbonated. A lot of that carbonation stays in solution. For the mouthfeel on this, it's very light, very light bodied. Um, it's residually got almost nothing. It's a very dry finishing beer, um, but drinks super, super easy. I was actually expecting a tiny bit more body in this one, but it didn't end up that way necessarily, uh, but that's all right. Anyway, let's go in for flavor. This is, this is really good. <laughs> it has a more subdued and restrained flavor than a quad. Uh, it has a little less complexity than a quad, but it doesn't mean that it's without complexity uh, at all. It's got a very satisfying, very like full malty breadiness, uh, first of all, in the flavor. And then on top of that, there's a significant amount of kind of like a, Almost like a Dr. Pepper type flavor. <laughs> um, it's kind of got that little bit of a cherry slash raisin slash fig kind of character, like a dark cherry, I suppose. It, it's kind of cool. It's like a mildly Dr. Peppery kind of flavor. It's not sweet like a soda, and it's not uh, like as cherry like as a Dr. Pepper, but it's kind of got that, that, that general idea going on. It's got a little bit of a toasty character to it. Um, nothing too strong or overpowering. The other thing in this is that it's kind of got this cool little tobacco note going on. It doesn't taste like tobacco like if you're smoking tobacco, but it's like the smell of sweet cigar smoke, if that makes sense. Or the smell of a cigar before you smoke it. It's actually really pleasant. Overall, it's got a lot of yeast character coming out of it too. It's like, uh, got this kind of like pear apple thing going on, which is really nice. Um, kind of spiciness, a little bit of a pepperiness to it as well. Minus the uh, the appearance, you know, and, and the, the lack of head. Otherwise, it's it's a really good beer. Um, it's actually really pretty much exactly what I wanted it to be. It's actually a little heavy on alcohol overall. Um, <laughs> definitely ended up being a little bit more boozy than I think I intended. But the flip side of that is that you actually can't taste the booze in this. It's aged out nicely enough that it's not even apparent. It is supremely drinkable, it's very flavorful, it's uh, it's just really a, a treat, and it was well worth waiting for. Um, 
uh, lately a lot of the beers that I've been making uh, kind of push through production relatively fast. It was really nice to actually take a beer and deliberately wait on it, and deliberately let it sit there and mature over time. And it tends to be worth it pretty much every single time you do that. So let's go to potential improvements now. I think I probably, first of all, and most obviously, I would nix that protein rest because it, I guess it was somehow long enough of a rest, even at 10 minutes, that maybe it has something to do with the ramp up time, but it broke down all those proteins that were needed to provide structure to the head. And that's really unfortunate to see because it just looks like a soda in the glass. If it wasn't for that, this would be a fantastic beer in all categories, but that's an easy fix. Next time, just do a regular two-step mash, don't do a three-step mash, and that'd be fine. Other than that, I probably, if I'm really looking for something, and I'm really being picky about how I like my Belgians, I probably would have actually fermented this a bit colder in primary fermentation. It's very ester heavy. You get a lot of pear. You get a lot of that kind of rose character. You don't get as much of the phenol side of the yeast, which is the spicy and clovey kind of characteristics. I don't get very much, if any, clove. Now, the vast majority of people don't like that clove flavor, and that's totally fine. However, I'm kind of weird, and I like to have that balance of, of clove and, uh, and pear kind of esters to come through my Belgian yeasts, and I probably could have just fermented it a bit colder. That being said, the ramp up schedule that I used and the, the long fermentation time that I used really ensured this came out very dry, which is exactly the way it should be. Um, albeit a bit boozier than I intended, so I'd probably back off on the overall level of ingredients, the overall amount of malt that I used in this beer next time. And that's all there is to it. Other than that, I really enjoyed making this one. It was actually really fun to take some bottles and bottle condition some of this stuff. I haven't bottled in years. Um, it was a really nice way of doing that, so I can squirrel away a couple bottles for like a year or so and see what happens over time uh, while I still enjoy the vast majority of the beer on tap. As far as Trappist Ale yeasts go, uh, between this and the, and the Trappist High Gravity Strain, um, I actually think I preferred this one. The 1214 did a really good job of bringing out a lot of extra flavors and also did a fantastic job with a higher alcohol level. Uh, last time I used the West Mall on the 3787, uh, it was kind of rough with the alcohol. That had a little bit more to do with my fermentation uh, than it did with the yeast strain though. So uh, keep that in mind. But otherwise, really did enjoy this. I did double check, the 1214 is the same strain as the T58 dry yeast, uh, so if you do happen to just want to use a dry yeast for your fermentation, go ahead and use that one, you'll get the same, pretty much the same results. But anyway, thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you learned something, and I hope you are well equipped to make a great Belgian double of your own. As always, please, if you learned something, please like and subscribe. Also, please comment down below with what you think about the brew day and the beer overall, and Anything else that you might have to lend to the discussion, I really do enjoy talking with everybody. If you want to support the channel, I do have a merch store that includes this t-shirt here you see if you like this one. Um, I also have plenty of other options and plenty of other colors available as well. Uh, that's a great way to help support this channel. In the description box, first of all, you're going to find the recipe for this beer as I brewed it. That is tuned for the claw hammer supply system. That should work pretty well for any other type of all-in-one electric brew in a bag type of system. Secondly, you're going to find a list of all of my favorite homebrewing equipment. And lastly, of course, you're going to find a link to the Claw Hammer Supply System as well as my merch store if you want to purchase any of those things or check out any of the merch. Uh, but I do appreciate your support regardless. I do my best to upload a new video roughly every week or two, depending on what's going on in my life. But if you want to check out other forms of social media, I am on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. I also have a Patreon, which is also linked in the description box. Uh, but anyway, thank you for watching, and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.